some of the most powerful lessons on faith and faithfulness in the scriptures are connected to flora, trees and plants. And in Flora and Faith Part 1, we're going to be diving into the grapevine as we seek to get a better understanding of what Jesus was doing in John chapter 15. Part 1, here we go. As we launch into this brand new series, we are beginning with one of the most well-known flora in the entire Bible, and that is of the grapevine. In Hebrew, it is geffen. And as we are moving towards John 15 and Jesus's famous words around a vine, uh, we're going to lay a little bit of foundation to help you to understand the significance of the vine in the Hebrew scriptures because when Jesus jumps into John 15, he's not beginning with a blank slate. He is jumping into vineyard reality. So one of the things that we find very early in the scriptures, Deuteronomy 8.8, is that this is one of the primary flora of the land of Israel, listed alongside of wheat and barley, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, honey. You have vines. Uh, Vines were uh, a symbol of the peace and prosperity of living the good life. You see this in several passages. Micah 4.4 says, everyone will sit under their own vine. Just this beautiful picture of security and things are going well. And you see this even in the land today where you have vines draped over top of awnings. In Psalm 87 to 9, we have the story of Israel, the Exodus story, how God rescues and redeems them. And we see the language connected to a vine where it says, Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. Israel is connected to a vine. And we see this in the Exodus story that was initiated or allowed Israel to leave in Passover or during the very first Passover. We're going to come back to that. So hold that Passover theme because you already know that's part of John chapter 15. So Israel is connected to the vine. Now, Todd Bolin, who is BiblePlaces.com, where we use most of our photos from, is a brilliant scholar, teacher, educator, and just very succinctly, he says this about Israel and the connection to the vine. A fruitful vine was symbolic of obedient Israel, while wild grapes or an empty vine spoke of Israel's disobedience. Right, clean, tight, to the point. When Israel's doing what is right, good grapes. If they're not doing right, bad grapes or no grapes at all. Uh, You see this in Isaiah chapter five, what we call the song of the vineyard. And the prophet Isaiah is doing his work in the latter part of the eighth century BC. The Northern kingdom has been exiled by Assyria. The Southern kingdom is living into disobedience. And God through Isaiah in Isaiah chapter five says this. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. And then you have the exile that will come later to Babylon in fulfillment to the fact that Israel wasn't producing good grapes. And so you can see how this language is foundational to Jesus's illustration that he gives in John 15. But before we jump into these first few verses of John 15, a couple more quick pieces of context. John 14 ends with the upper room discourse, the Last Supper, and Jesus says, get up, let us go from here. So he says to the disciples, let's go. And then you've got John 15, 16, 17, and then chapter 18 begins with when he, Jesus, had finished praying, which is in John 17, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. 
Now there's been a lot of discussion around how to understand these passages in light of one another. For me personally, I think it's pretty simple. I think that Jesus leaves the upper room with his disciples and he goes to the Temple Mount and does John 15, 16, and 17. And so when he says, okay, that, or it says that he left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley, I think they're leaving from the temple. And here's why. So here is a model of Jerusalem in the first century world. You can see the temple dominating the landscape. And this is oriented north, south, east, and west. Now, based on a number of details from the text, we believe that Jesus and his disciples are having the Last Supper on what is known as the Western Hill or the Upper City. And that when Jesus says, get up, let us go, Jesus takes his disciples, in my opinion, up to the Temple Mount, does John 15, 16, and 17, and then they cross the Kidron Valley to go to Gethsemane. Now, if you were to stand on the east side of the Temple Mount and look to the east, this is your view. So you've got the Mount of Olives here. The traditional location for Gethsemane is here. And in order to get into Gethsemane, you've got a cross, you got it, the Kidron Valley. So it makes sense from just a geography perspective. Let's throw in a couple of other cultural realities that when you go up on the Temple Mount here, you can see that you have this giant platform and then you've got the temple proper. Now, Josephus tells us, as well as a reference in the Mishnah of the rabbinic literature, that with the entry into what is known as the holy place, that there were golden grapevines that were on the top of the temple. Now, it's not displayed here onto the sides of the door, but it's also mentioned that there were grapevines strung from the pillars as you go in or from the facade of the holy place. And Leon Rittenmeyer did a great job of showing that what that might look like. But the point that I'm making here is that it would make sense to be jumping into John 15 if Jesus has just gone up on the Temple Mount and his disciples are looking up and they're seeing all of these big golden grapevines representing Israel for Jesus to jump into the story that he gives. Now, whether it's taking place on the Temple Mount or not doesn't make or break John 15. The disciples understand vineyard language. It is all over Israel. They would have known what Jesus was saying, even if they weren't being visually reminded of the grapevine. So Israel is connected to the vine. As you know, Jesus is going to launch into, some of you know this, it's his seventh I am statement in the Gospel of John. I am the true vine. That is explosive from the get-go. Because Israel was associated with the vine and Jesus goes, I am the true vine. Jesus is not replacing Israel. He comes from within Israel to be the greatest expression of who Israel was called to be. And Jesus says, I have the authority to command you, my disciples. I am the one with the identity as the true vine. I am the one that Israel has been longing for. It is a messianic statement. It is a massive statement of identity. It is a massive statement of authority. And Jesus is now saying, I am commanding you, and this is what you need to do in order to produce good grapes. Now, as we go through the very famous John 15, I want you to be thinking about two questions. Specifically, what does Jesus want with this illustration? What is he trying to communicate? What does he want his disciples to do? And then the second question is, and who's who in this illustration? Okay, you already know Jesus is the true vine. I've already given that to you. So notice with me, John 15, verses one and following. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Okay, so there you go. You already know who God is in this. He's the vine dresser, he's the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. 
No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So you're already picking up on the language that the disciples are the branches. Here's where Jesus clarifies it. He says once again, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burn. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So who's who in this? Jesus is the vine, God is the gardener, and the disciples are the branches, okay? So that's, that's a second question that we were wanting to keep on our mind. Let's now answer that first question. What does Jesus want? Okay, it was accentuated in the last verse we read when Jesus says that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So we go back to the Hebrew scriptures illustration, and when Israel was living in obedience to God, they produced good grapes. And Jesus goes, when you are living in obedience to me, you will produce good grapes. Jesus wants his disciples to bear good fruit, not only to demonstrate that they are his disciples, but because Jesus wants us to live a fruitful life. Now, you can get that from the reading of John 15, but when you go a little bit deeper into the illustration, you begin to realize there are a couple of other layers that Jesus is communicating that his disciples would have got immediately, and for us, we're like, we need a little bit more out of this illustration. So, notice here again a vineyard, and you can clearly see the grapes, you can see vines, you can see the stump. There's a lot going on here, so let me just overlay it with the parts of a vineyard. Now, you can say, ah, I can, I can make out the stump here. Yep, I can see the vine there. The branch is kind of hard to see. Okay, I can see the fruit. Let me just distill this and just make this a little bit cleaner to look at. Here are the parts of a vine, okay, or of a vineyard. You have a stump that comes out of the ground. A vine comes from that. And from the vine, you have branches. And from the branches, of course, you have the fruit. So let me just ask you, if Jesus also wants to bear fruit in the world, who has to bear that fruit? It's his disciples. So part of what Jesus is going to continue to say is remain in me, remain in me, remain in me, because the vine is what nourishes the branches that produces the fruit. Jesus wants to bear fruit in the world. And if Jesus is going to bear fruit, it's coming through his disciples. And so there is a healthiness to his disciples that he wants them to experience because in doing so, they will produce good fruit. That's what Jesus wants out of this illustration. So now let's go back and try to make sense of a couple of other pieces that we just read right through. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Got that? He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And you go, man, cuts off, That's, that seems harsh. Well, let's jump into the Greek here. It's the word iro, and it means to lift up, to raise up, or to take away, as in to remove. Now, here's what's really interesting for me about Iro is that the word Iro is used in its various forms 101 times in the New Testament. And yet, in no other place other than John 15 is the word Iro translated as to cut off or cuts off. Now, some translations will say, he takes away every branch of me that bears no fruit. And that kind of, you know, lessens a bit of the harshness, but we're still talking about something being cut off or something being removed. But in its most basic understanding, Iro means to lift up or to raise up. Now, one other piece before I put that together is this. Notice that here in John 15, we're at the very beginning where he cuts off every branch in me. 
So branches that are actively staying with Jesus, Jesus goes, yeah, if you're not bearing good fruit, God just wants to cut you off. And you go, okay, later on, we read that if a branch doesn't want to remain in Jesus, they are like a branch that is thrown away. They are removed. But here at the very beginning of the illustration, we're talking about a branch that wants to actively be in Jesus. Is that what God really wants to do? That if we're struggling, if we're not producing good fruit, that God just wants to cut us off? Well, I don't think that's the best way of looking at that. In fact, lots of people share that same sentiment. You're seeing this more and more in commentaries. You're seeing this in the newer translations that people are footnoting going, actually, this is probably a better way to do it. And probably the next time that that translation has an update, it will then replace what's been there before and they're gonna swap places. And here's why, is that when we hear about a vineyard, we think like Napa Valley-esque. We think very clean rows and very organized, and yet that is not how it was in the ancient world. In fact, you still find this in some places in Israel, definitely many places in Jordan today. Vines grew on the ground. They were not in trellises. That came later because the problem was that when vines grow on the ground, and you know branches are growing out of the vine and then you have fruit that starts to grow is that the moisture from the ground can actually create like a fungus for the fruit and it can stunt their growth and a grape starts to look more like a raisin and so the first thing a gardener does is not cut off the branch the gardener wants fruit the gardener will actually lift up the vine with its branches and prop it under a forked stick or on a rock in order to get the grapes up off the ground to give them a chance to regain a sense of healthiness in order to produce good fruit. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, this is a really great image um, from, from Todd Bolin in Bible Places of just even how today they can take the stump and wedge a rock to it to get the stump further away from the ground so that as those vines grow, you don't run into this issue as much of contracting a fungus. And I think this is what Jesus is talking about, that when a branch is actively wanting to be in him, the gardener doesn't want to cut you off. The gardener wants to lift you up to allow the sun to burn away the moisture, to allow a sense of fruitfulness to be regained in your life. And that's been my experience, that as I am seeking to follow Jesus, there are times and seasons where I'm struggling with things and it just feels like I'm kind of stuck in kind of the muck around my life and it's stunting my growth and I just need Jesus to help me to burn away the impurities in order to experience that fruitfulness. And I think that's part of what this illustration is. A uh, second thing then is that he lifts up every branch of me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear, bear fruit, he prunes so that will be even more fruitful. So when we're stunted in our growth, God wants to work in our lives in order to regain a sense of growth. But when we are growing and bearing good fruit, Jesus goes, this is great. Now God wants to start pruning you. And pruning is not a process that is fun. It is actually painful for the vine. It is painful for the branches. And what happens is, is that you have this really nice pruning tool that this gardener showed me on a field trip to Sardis in Turkey a number of years ago. And he was out there and he was working in the vineyard and he's showing our group the process. This is how you get good grapes. And he was so generous and it was just this amazing picture of just fruitfulness and what we are after in our own stories to be like. But the point is, is that there is a process of pruning and when you see what the pruning knife looks like, you go, that looks sharp. It, it, it is. And what it does is that it cuts away all of the things that are preventing good growth for the grapes. Now, here's the thing that was a huge learning piece for me, is that the gardener or the vine dresser is not only cutting off like, you know, dead and decaying leaves that is sucking moisture that's taking away from the branches being able to produce good fruit, but the vine dresser is also cutting away good healthy shoots and leaves that are not in and of themselves bad, 
but they're actually sucking nourishment away from the branch or they're blocking the sunlight from getting to the grapes. And it's this picture about how when we are producing good fruit, God comes in and says, listen, I want to start cutting good things out of your life so that you have the space for the best things. That it's not just about God cutting bad things out of our life, it's like there are good things that are keeping us from the best things. And in fact, we did an entire teaching on this, saying yes to the best, that I just want you to go take a look at if you wanna dig deeper into this in episode 17. But that's what God does when we're producing good fruit, is God goes, I want to cut up all the things in your life that are good in order for you to produce the best. And in order to do that, friends, in order to have our funguses burned off, if you will, in order to have good things in our lives cut out, Jesus makes the emphatic point with this word, you got to remain in me. And the word remain is just the Greek word meno, and it means to remain, to stay, or to abide. And actually, I really like this word abide better because remain means, you know, for me, okay, I just want to remain in the vine. Abide carries a sense of intentionality, this action of every day seeking to abide in the vine of Jesus Christ through prayer, through silence, through studying the word of God, being in community, going to church or whatever your place of worship is, and just having these discipleship disciplines where you are actively seeking the face of Jesus and allowing him to do into our lives what only he can do. But we are active participants in this process and that we are called to be people who are abiding in the vine. And when we are doing that, we experience a fruitfulness in our lives that not only is an indication of our own health, it's an indication that we have taken Jesus's words and we've applied it to our lives, but we also become good fruit for other people to engage in the world and they're able to taste and see who Jesus Christ is. And so friends, may you be someone who bides in the vine and produces good fruit. So there you go, part one. Brad Nelson will be jumping into part two. And as always, may you walk out the text well in your life.